Center working with uh, field and row crops for the last uh, 35 years or so. So we started with papyrophos, we're going to end with papyrophos, but uh, um, it's, uh, well, it's a little bit more restricted environment. It really hasn't changed all that much. Um, uh, I, I want to start, hang on, uh, you're getting a uh, handout? Uh, they have them. Oh, you have good. Okay, so you can follow along with uh, with what's up here uh, with the handout for uh, more information. But I want to start by saying that uh, we uh, the, the statewide IPM project with me as a principal investigator were, were provided a contract from DPR to look at critical uses of papyrophos in four major cropping systems. So right off the bat, on the first one where it says background. Please excuse the word citrus there. Obviously that slide didn't get updated, but it was alfalfa is what that meant to say. But we were looking at citrus, alfalfa, almonds, and cotton, the four top users of papyrophos. And um, we were uh, at charge with coming up with industry, I, and, I, and I really emphasize that, industry input on where the critical uses for this, for this active ingredient is. Uh, in alfalfa, we had uh, the California Association Alliance, of California Alliance of Forage, California Alfalfa and Forage Alliance, uh, and uh, as as the lead on that, and um, uh, Ken and Michael was one of the members of that uh, of that group as well, and we spent uh, quite a few months going over where the critical uses were. So let me just kind of go through real quick and, and let you know that. Um, uh, alfalfa was one of the more challenging crops for a number of reasons, but primarily what we were asked to do was review the critical uses, um, and a critical use is defined as the use of papyrophos against pests for which there are few or no alternatives. And uh, the input, as I said, came from, uh, came from the industry. That report is available. You have a you have both a website as well as a QR code to get to it if you'd like to look at it. Um, but it, uh, alfalfa was one that came up really clearly that we don't have a whole lot of alternatives. And again, I'm talking now, we did this in 2014, and I'll try and update where we are now. But particularly, uh, alfalfa has never gotten any neonicotinoids registered. So for aphid control, we really were limited to organophosphates dimethoate clopyrophos primarily. Um, we, have, uh, we have a lack of good materials for uh, weevil, uh, and, and, and certainly clopyrophos can play a role under those under particular bad years. So among these crops, there were really different major drivers, but uh, uh, alfalfa was one that really came out as there weren't, when we put up, a, we developed a matrix on on availability and, uh, and pests, there were just weren't a whole lot of checks as compared to say some of the other crops. So it is rather critical. But these were the critical pests that were identified, and, and, and the groups agreed that there wasn't a more importance than others in terms of a tier because or hierarchy because we we're very concerned that DPR might take this information and say, oh, it's not important here, so don't use it here. But that's not the case. But we did set these kinds of tier up. So the top three here that you see, the uh, the blue aphid, the, the alfalfa weevils, and cowpea, there are very, very few alternatives to these. Uh, in fact, papyrophos is primarily the only. Um, but when we get down to key pests with, with uh, important pests with alternatives, that says some of your worms, army worms and alfalfa caterpillar, bee army worms as well. There are critically important pests, but there are, are alternatives, and then there's occasional pests we have. And what I want to talk about and really, really emphasize to you all is this is the this is the monthly use pattern for Clopyrophos in, in Merced County for the last, well, I got it through 2012, so about 10 years worth. And this is one of the few, this is the only cropping system that had this bimodal curve of use. Either if you look at it from pounds or you look at it from acres. On average, alfalfa is putting on a little less than half a pound per acre, which is less than the average across the state. 
uh, and, and, uh, but it's putting across a lot of acres, which makes the use up. But you see these two, these two uh, primary use patterns there. Well, this one's I can explain by talking about blue alfalfa aphid, pea aphid, weevil. The summer one is a little more difficult. And it's probably, in my opinion, either there's a lot of cow, uh, cow pea aphid out there, or it's primarily worms. And I'm betting it's primarily worms with lock-on as a primary, primary uh, use. And that is the one where we have good alternatives. Uh, it was when, when we were here last, I can't remember when that was. It 2012. Was 2012 we were actually here. And I remember talking with Cannon and um, Tom Gage, and they said, oh yeah, we've been using Corrigin on these fields since you know, when it first came out, and they really liked it, it gave them good control, and it didn't blow everything else up. So both Corrigin and Belt, for example, are available, and uh, very selective, and certainly more costly. But if we're really limited on, on, on this is really where, the, where, the, where the, 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 the key pest is, if we have alternatives and we want to show that we're making great strides and trying to use it only when absolutely necessary, then this is the one where I think we need to be making a little bit better, better headway on. Now that said, since we did this, um, there are two products that have come available. One, most of you say wouldn't be available because it's belief on a local, sec uh, local special, uh, special local needs. And we got it off of the, up, off of the uh, effort by the seed alfalfa group. So it's a 62-day pre-harvest interval. But when Blue Alfalfa King blew, roaring through this area, particularly Dos Palos, uh, back in 2014, it was on seedling fields in January that were easily 62 days away from first harvest. So it would have been a great product, but wasn't available at that time. So it does have a place uh, in certain situations. But uh, this January we got Savanto, which is an excellent aphid material. And uh, so we do have an alternative to just, just straight chlorpyrifos for aphid. Speaking of the blue alfalfa aphid, I don't, it wasn't much of a problem this year for most people, I, I'm hearing. That is to say, my customer, compla my customer complaint meters didn't really register a whole lot. Um, but what was interesting was it started in 2013, uh, 2014 saw it up in this area, particularly in seedling fields. Uh, Stanislaus began to see it in 2014. They had a horrendous problem, which is why they got the local, special local needs for us. A little bit up in Sacramento Valley, and just a touch up in Thule. This year, Thule Lake was absolutely devastated by that by that aphid. Unbelievable. And so they did, uh, so I don't have the data with me, but we have some really good data that Steve Orloff worked with, looking at the impacts of a broad range of broad spectrum and selective materials. But it's interesting, you have that very, very dormant variety, very cool condition. Pictures he sent us saying, you can't believe these fields, and he says, sorry for the bad picture, but it's snowing here right now. Oh. And uh, uh, so from Imperial Valley all the way to Thule Lake, this thing has run up and down, has run up the state. But apparently is, um, for whatever reason, is somewhat back in balance in a lot of places. It's usually bad, it's been bad for a couple of years, it seems to go away. So anyway, I just really urge you, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about some summer pests right now. So this is data from the uh, project that Carlos is looking at. And these are army worms per sweep. This is the pest, uh, the pest of uh, what we're most interested in right now. And um, you know, you see they're kind of going up, but this is <coughs> not even half a worm per sweep. And the threshold is 10 to 15 uh, unparasitized worms per sweep. So we're still really, really below. And, and this is what I'm hearing alfalfa this year is not a whole lot of problems north and south in terms of some of the insects. Cowpea is the other one, although he doesn't break them out. Uh, uh, time does sort of say early season it's going to be blue, then you get a lot of pea, and then the summer months it tends to be uh, it tends to be uh, cowpea. The threshold's about the same, 10, 10 or so per uh, per stem, and you can see that you know the populations around here are well below any damaging levels, which is all good news. Now I want to think I want to introduce. A couple of things. One of them is I want to emphasize to everybody that we're going to be doing a series of trainings uh, based around this uh, IPM 
sort of IPM for uh, or best management practices for use of clopyrifos. This is part of the contract we have. The one closest to here is going to be as hosted by Dr. Shannon Mueller. It'll be September 18th. It'll be about a, about an hour and a half, two hour uh, intensive training about the best way to approach the pests uh, that, that that we depend that the pests that that chlorpyrifos are critically uh, is critical against. And so it's you'll get more information about that. But I want to kind of put it in your uh, ear that there's going to be some really uh, really good uh, information being provided. You can't see this, but it's on your it's on it's in your paper, your handouts. I wanted to make sure you saw it. You guys are seeing this first. As part of this project, also we had to develop a decision support tool with our pest management guidelines. And if anybody's looked at the, anyone looks at the pest management guidelines, they realize they're very dense. They're very uh, they're very structured, and there's a whole lot of information buried in there that most people don't ever look for, ever find or look for. What we've done is set it up on a, on a tablet format, a smartphone format, a computer-based format that allows you to go through and select the pests, and it will come up with all the information, it'll consolidate all the information that's on the various pages. And it'll allow you to print out a final report like this. So there's only three windows. This is the final one. This report is actually saved for you somewhere, but it allows you to look at, in this case, we looked at Caterpillar, Beet armyworm, cowpea aphid, and western stripe. It puts them all together with what are the products, what are the, what are the uh, alternative practices, uh, what are the impacts on non-targets, including honeybees. Uh, this word you heard about uh, about about papyrophos uh, moving off site. Uh, this is connected right here to uh, to our water talk, so you can compare and look at what the what the uh, solubility and runoff threats are to human health. But you can basically put everything together here in one place and compare which product handles which of those pests that you're interested in. Uh, and, and if you happen to download this and save it, it comes out as a PDF. These are all live links. So you can just look at this once, and if you want more information about uh, conserving, conserving natural enemies, you can just click on that, it takes you right to that spot. So it really is going to be a nice, uh, a nice uh, streamlined approach to it, and uh, hope that uh, is this is going to be one of the key parts of our training there in September. And I just want to mention another project real quick. This is one that's not quite ready for prime time yet, but um, um, the gentleman here in the red shirt with the Fresno Grizzly hat on is uh, is, is Carlos Sia uh, from uh, who's who? Huh? Hey, Sus, pardon me. I was thinking, looking at you. Hey, Sus, uh, my deep apologies. Um, uh, who's, who's our summer intern uh, with this project? And this is a national project. We're looking at alfalfa in cotton. And the primary reason we wanted to do this was it's, it's built upon, one, some modeling that they've got some expert modelers. So we're looking right now at, uh, at what is it that drives blue alfalfa aphid. We're also have already developed a model they've been testing for stem nematode. Why is it why is it worse in YOLO and less so in uh, in Kern type of thing? But it allows a, an individual to collect data from the field and it does all the mapping for you. Um, and why I'm interested in this is that if we'd had something like this in 2013, 2014, and we had people using it, we could have seen that blue alfalfa aphid start popping up where it was popping up. And we could have tracked it, we could have seen in, in more detail where, where it was coming from. Um, if it comes up again and we have some modeling to be able to do a predictive model on it, that's going to help as well. So it's just a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, it's a platform that I'm, I'm hoping we can use to, particularly with some of the key pests, more as a communication among the community north to south than it is trying to, trying to uh, collect data for an individual field for your purposes. So we'll talk to you tomorrow. We'll probably be contacting some of you about that. Some of this is, uh, right now we're just using some of the, some of the information that Carlos is collecting, just so we can try this thing out. And this is a non-public website, so it's not uh, it's, it's only uh, it's only available to those who are actually putting the data in. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there and take any questions you might have. Uh, one other thing that I was asked to mention, or I asked I could mention it is the next two days there's going to be four cotton meetings scattered up and down the state. The nearest one here is going to be Tranquility on Friday at 10 o'clock. At the, at the farmers co-op gym and it's about sticky cotton. Um, this isn't a problem as much up here. I'm not sure it's a problem at all if you're not growing. It's not a problem at all if you're not growing cotton, but where we have grown cotton in certain locations here in the valley, it has become a major 
world export issue. And uh, we're already down on acreage and we don't need to lose any, uh, any additional. So the uh, cotton industry has asked us to put together a, uh, a series of uh, four meetings up and down the state to remind everybody to um, take this very, very serious, uh, very, very seriously. So again, we're going to have one at uh, Tranquility at the Westside Farmers Co-op. You're all welcome at uh, 10 o'clock on Friday. So if you want any information, I've got it here and we can get some contact. So. And there's PCA credits for that day? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, I had to think about that because we're bringing in the, we're, we're bringing in the egg commissioners as well to talk about the fire costs, but you heard pretty much all that today as well. So, but anyway, thank you very much and thanks for coming out.